listen. To AM 560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM 560 mobile app on your Alexa powered smart speaker and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM 560 The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, part of uh, Senator Raphael Warnock's victory speech on Tuesday night was interesting, given uh, the run-up to this cycle, the midterm election, was in part about uh, Republicans allegedly working to suppress the vote at the state level in states like Georgia, right? Uh, big boycotts uh, when... Georgia moved some minor election reforms, again, the state of Georgia, because it's a state and local issue, the administration of elections, particularly a state issue. And it was going to be Jim Crow 2.0. That's what it was, right? That's what the president said. That's what Stacey Abrams said. That's what oh, Raphael yeah. Warnock said. Jim Crow 2.0, suppressing the black vote in particular, but suppressing Voters. That's what the Republicans were in business to do. That was going to be the result of the law. That was the reforms that were passed in Georgia. So much so that, you know, the Major League Baseball had to move the All-Star game. Oh, that's right. And what happened instead? They had large voter turnout and early but, voting. And, and despite Warnock's victory, don't think for a second that it's still not Jim Crow 2.0. There are those who would look at the outcome of this race and say that there's no voter suppression in Georgia. Let me be clear. Just because people endured long lines that wrapped around buildings some blocks long, just because they endured the rain and the cold and all kinds of tricks in order to vote, doesn't mean that voter suppression does not exist. It simply means that you, the people, have decided that your voices will not be silenced. And so expect that to continue right through 2024 and until and unless um, these demagogues like Warnock are defeated. There is an important case before the Supreme Court, oral arguments uh, were uh, offered the other day, uh, one, the religious liberty case that we talked about out of Colorado, 303 Creative, and we're actually going to have the graphic artist on oh, yeah. in the 8 o'clock hour. Uh, another important case before the court involves a redistricting plan in North Carolina. The case is Moore v. Harper, and the Supreme Court is taking up what the Constitution's election clause means against the backdrop of a Democrat party that wants to federalize elections, the administration of elections writ large. For more on that case and its implications, pleased to be joined by Professor William Jacobson. He is a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He's also the founder of LegalInsurrection.com and president of the Legal Insurrection <coughs> Foundation. <coughs> professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me back. So um, is uh, this uh, case, uh, the Moore case before the Supreme Court, um, is this a complicated case in terms of uh, explicitly articulating what is already explicitly articulated in the Elections Clause of the Constitution? Well, at its core, it's not complicated. I mean, the uh, Elections Clause says that the time manner uh, of Elections for House of Representatives and Senate shall be determined by the legislatures of each state. So that's about as clear as you get. I think the issue becomes at what point, and the issue in the case is at what point, can state courts essentially intervene in that whole process. And in North Carolina, they intervene, the Supreme Court, on a very um, vague and amorphous standard essentially, you know, a fairness standard, that they, that they didn't feel that the redistricting was fair, and therefore they uh, overturned it. So that's, that's the issue. The question presented to the court for this case um, was not whether the elections clause exists. Of course, it, it does. 
but whether they can overturn, quote, based on vague state constitutional provisions regarding ensuring a fair or free election. So that's that's the issue and that uh, it's I'm not 100 percent clear how it's going to come out. But uh, it's very important because you recall in 2020, state courts, particularly in Pennsylvania, that was the most prominent, simply uh, tossed aside what the legislature had planned for the election. So it's, it's very political as to whether Democrat controlled state Supreme Courts or Republican, but it's usually done by Democrat controlled state courts uh, can override the legislature. So the, the plaintiffs uh, uh, in the case, the more plaintiffs, they argue the election clause legislation is subject to state court review because Congress is subject to federal judicial review when it acts under the election clause to make or alter congressional election laws. Is that is that wrong? Is that right? Well, I, I think that's what listening to the oral arguments, it's, it's not clear where the court's going to come out. There seem to be a lot of confusion all around as to what sort of judicial review would be permitted. And that's one of the arguments that, well, Congress is subject to judicial review. Why shouldn't the state legislature passing these laws regarding the election be subject? And I don't know how it's going to come out, but that's really the the, uh, crux of the the issue the court's grappling with is that, you know, uh, courts, uh, not because it's in the Constitution, but it's really a matter of practice uh, since the early days of the Republic, is subject to judicial review. So... I, th- I think that what's probably going to happen and what a lot of people are predicting is that it's going to recognize the supremacy of the state legislature, but not uh, without limit. And it's going to toss out vague standards for review, but it might allow some sort of other standard for review if it's in the state constitution, if there's a, a more clear standard that doesn't give unbridled discretion to the the court system. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, I'm I'm why in part why I'm not persuaded by the uh, argument being made by the plaintiffs, um, in addition to just the faulty legal reasoning. I mean, you have a you have a supremacy clause that addresses this review question, it seems to me. But in addition to that, they also say that a plain text reading of the elections clause of the Constitution would be, quote, damaging for American democracy. We're getting like a political everything that I disagree with is a threat to our democracy type of argument that has become standard fare for the Democrats. Well, that's right. The, the standard of uh, justice is does it help my political party when it comes right. to a lot of these Democratic arguments? Uh, and the, the definition of democracy is do I win and do I pre- prevail? If, if I do, then I'm, then it's democratic. If it's not, then it's not. So, yeah, I mean, I think there was an unusual amount of hysteria surrounding this case. Uh, I know, you know, the go to argument from Democrats is end of democracy, but it really was hyperventilated here. And I'm not really sure what they're afraid of, because this could work either way politically. You know, if you have a Democrat controlled legislature, they could pass various rules and methods of voting, et cetera, uh, that are not favorable to Republicans. So this is not a one-way street, but the Democrats uniquely seem to be concerned about it. And I think it's because if you look at least at the last few years, it really seems to be, you know, the Democrat-controlled state courts that have intervened, not the other way around. Uh, But it is curious that the Democrats are in a frenzy about this and the Republicans aren't. Now, you wrote an article about the Twitter files and them being about family, Biden family corruption and media cover-up. But can you expand on the fact that you said Musk made a mistake by portraying this as a First Amendment issue? Right. Well, well, the day, the Democrats' favorite argument whenever something bad happens is to, ar- like Bill Clinton, argue of what the meaning of is is. So get into these endless loops of arguments about definitions of things. We see that in the critical race theory thing. You could have this horrendous racialization of uh, kindergarten education and uh, the, you know, based on critical race principles, they say, well, that's not really critical race theory. And so they divert the whole argument into an argument over the definition of something. And that's essentially what's going on with the Twitter files. I mean, what the Twitter files show is what we probably already knew, which is that left leaning or far left people who run big tech and social media platforms, um, you know, put their thumb on the scale 
in favor of people from the left. And uh, that was true with Twitter with in terms of banning people. And so now, uh, because Elon Musk referred to it as a free speech First Amendment issue, they're now arguing, well, this is a private company. There's no proof the government ordered them to do anything. And so we're getting into this whole argument about is it First Amendment, is it government, is it not? And to me, that's a side issue. The, the issue is that they actually were um, banning people. They actually were letting their political opinions influence the single most important platform for political argument when it comes to uh, you know this country, at least. And so that's really the issue. And what they did is they suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story, which really is the Biden family corruption story. That's what the story is about. It just so happens the laptop provided inside evidence. And so that, to me, was a mistake because the First Amendment only applies if there's government action involved. And that's not necessary to the main point here, which is that Twitter was manipulating the uh, the insiders at Twitter were manipulating the election. Uh, what uh, the the main story behind a new New York state law uh, that governs blogs like yours, if you were in New York, uh, is the story uh, is a First Amendment issue. I should say that is the main story here. And I wanted to get your reaction to uh, this op ed uh, from earlier in the week in the journal by Eugene Volokh, who's a law professor at UCLA. And, and runs a, a blog as well, the Volokh Conspiracy. Um, and uh, he uh, writes in the journal, um, the New York state law would mandate, I post publicly my policy for, for responding to comments that, quote, vilify, humiliate, or incite violence against a group based on race, color, religion, ethnicity, national origin, disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. It also requires I give readers a way to complain about my blog's content, and it obligates me to respond directly. And he says, I don't want to moderate such content, and I don't endorse the state's definition of hate speech. I do sometimes delete comments, but I do it based on my own editorial judgment, not state command. And now I'm being conscripted by obligating me to do the state's bidding with regard to viewpoints that the New York, state of New York condemns. The law violates the First Amendment. Is Professor Volokh right about that? Well, he, he is. He absolutely is. It's a horrible law. I mean, it's a, a law, you know, that essentially... Uh, would shut down the comment sections in virtually every website that's subject to its jurisdiction. Uh, I've seen that law, and it refers to you know for-profit websites, so it wouldn't necessarily apply to all websites. And who do business in New York? Who knows what that means? Because do you have readers in New York? Is that doing business in New York? Yeah. But if it applies to you, you now become the cops. You now become the equivalent of your campus, you know, speech code people. And uh, the problem is you're subject to fines and you're subject to potential criminal liability if you don't do it. And so I think what you would see is uh, websites would simply do what many have already done because moderating comment sections is so difficult. They'll just turn them off. So they will deprive people of the platform out of fear of being liable. Um, and, and so it's, it's vague. What is hate speech? What is, you know, uh, things that are offensive? Uh, how is this going to be enforced? And it's particularly troubling given the nature of the New York state government, which is you have an attorney general who would have the enforcement authority for this, who is a rabid partisan um, who ran for office with the pledge. This was her central campaign theme with the pledge that she would get Trump and, and his family members. Right. So uh, that's the person we're going to have enforcing whether something is hate speech or not, that's the person who's going to be enforcing this law. Uh, so it, it's bad at, at, at every single level. This law is bad. Uh, and I, I'd be shocked if a court doesn't throw it out. He is Professor William Jacobson, the clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, also the founder of LegalInsurrection.com, which is a must-read blog, and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen. The more you'll know, this is Chicago's Morning Answer. Morning Answer. On AM560, The Answer. Lisa Booth here for Bishop Gold Group. So just when you think the stock market's recovering and everything's going back to normal, well, here comes another downturn. So what are you going to do? The answer is gold. The company that I trust is Bishop Gold Group. They can advise you on investing in gold and gold IRAs. 
So act now and get up to $5,000 in free silver with a qualified purchase. Call Bishop Gold Group on your phone, dial pound 